We welcome, um, we welcome you, Chris, Chris Waghorn from uh, Bible League, who is going to be our guest speaker. We look forward to how the Holy Spirit will enrich our hearts as you bring the gospel to us. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send our workers into his harvest field. Let's say this prayer together. All powerful God, in Jesus Christ, you turn death into life and defeat into victory. Increase our faith and trust in Him that we may triumph in the strength of the same Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Bless you, Lord, Jesus, now and forever. Hallelujah. The Lord be with you. And also with you. I will rise and go to my Father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy. I am no longer more worthy to be called your son. <coughs> Therefore, let us therefore draw near in full assurance of faith and confess our sins to the God of grace. We pray this prayer together. Merciful God, our Maker and our Judge, we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, and in what we have failed to do. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our leaders as ourselves. <coughs> We repent and are sorry for all our sins. Father, forgive us. Strengthen us to love and obey you in the years of life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <coughs> and the good news. 
Our gracious Almighty God, who has promised forgiveness to all who turn to Him in faith, pardon you, set you free from all your sins, strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, we come to that time when we greet each other with God's peace. We are the body of Christ. <laughs> Grace and peace be with you. And also with you. Let's share that Blessings to you, Coral, darling, I love you. Please be with you, Coral. I am you. Please be with you. Now, we have Gordon who will read to us from Acts 8. Thank you, Gordon. Do you want me to move this for you? Yes. 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 Well, our first reading today is from Acts 8, beginning at verse 26 and reading through to verse 40. While Philip was in Samaria, one of God's angel messengers came to him and said, Get up and go south along the desert road. You know, the road that goes from Jerusalem to the town called Gaza. So Philip got up and he started to go along that road. And he saw a man from Ethiopia country sitting in a trailer. And the horses were pulling the trailer along that road. He was the sort of man that could, couldn't have any kids. He worked for an important woman called Candace. She was the big boss over Ethiopia. That man was one of her important workers. He looked after all her money. But he had a break from that work and went to Jerusalem to show respect to God. And then he started to go back home along that road. Philip saw him sitting in his trailer and he was reading God's book. He was reading the part that Isaiah wrote a long time ago. Isaiah was one of God's men and told people God's messages. Then the Holy Spirit said to Philip, catch up with that trailer and walk along beside it. So Philip ran up close to the trailer and when he was beside it, he heard of the man reading from the words that Isaiah wrote in God's book. <coughs> Philip asked him, can you understand that book you are reading? The Ethiopian man said, no, I can't understand it. I need somebody to help me. Then he asked Philip to climb up into the trailer and sit beside him. He was reading these words in God's book. Some people took him away to kill him, just like men take a sheep away to kill it. But he was quiet and didn't say anything. You know that a sheep is quiet and it doesn't make a noise while men cover all its wool. Well, he was quiet, just like that. Men shamed him. They didn't give him a proper trial in court. Then they killed him, 
So now he can't have any kids. And the Ethiopian man said to Philip, who, who was Isaiah talking about? Was he talking about himself or somebody else? Then Philip told him that Isaiah was talking about Jesus. And he kept on talking and he told the Ethiopian man the good news about Jesus. They kept along the road and they came to some water. The Ethiopian man said, Look, there is some water. I want you to baptize me now. Then he told the man that he that was controlling the horses to stop. And the Ethiopian man and Philip went down into the water, and Philip baptized the Ethiopian man. After they came up out of the water, the Holy Spirit quickly took Philip away. The Ethiopian man never saw him again, but he was really happy, and he kept going on his way home. But the Holy Spirit put Philip in a town called Azotus. Philip ran around telling the people the good news about Jesus. He walked north and he told the good news about Jesus to the people in all the towns along the way until he got to the town called Caesarea and he stayed there. For the word of the Lord and the Lord God. <coughs> If you're able to stand for the gospel, please, if you can't, that's fine. The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew chapter 9, 35 to chapter 10, verse 8. Glory, Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then Jesus said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send our laborers to his then Jesus summoned his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon, the Cananean, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed Jesus. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, as you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of God has come near. Cure the sick. Raise the dead. Cleanse the lepers. Cast out demons. You receive without payment. Give without payment. For the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So come up, Chris. You're, you're, please be seated, everyone. We welcome Chris. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Good morning. My name is Chris Wakehorn, and I work for the Bible. 
Garden League as Development Officer in Victoria. I'd like to thank Paul and the staff at St Mark's for inviting me here today to share about what the Bible League uh, does in the world and the Kingdom. When I first met with Mark a little while ago, uh, Paul, sorry, I was deeply encouraged by the vision that he has for St Mark's Templestone and the tremendous zeal that he has for the Word and the Kingdom. I would like to thank all of the donors to Bible Link and the congregation today. Your support is hugely appreciated for the reasons that I'll be shortly getting into. Now, I arrived in Australia in about September 2019 uh, with an eight month pregnant wife uh, on the cusp of being safe to fly and our 18 month year old baby boy Joshua. The flight took 36 hours. Do you have any idea how stressful that flight was? Yes. <laughs> yes. Now, it wasn't until we arrived at Tullamarine that I must have got up too quickly from my seat or something, and I proceeded to faint forwards into the aisle of the aeroplane, at which point my 18-month-year-old baby boy attempted to drive his trunky suitcase over my prone body <laughs> as we exited the aircraft. While exiting the aircraft, we smelt the uh, fumes of New South Wales uh, in our nostrils, of course, with the bushfires. And then we went into the most uh, draconian lockdown on the planet. <laughs> now, fortunately, I visited uh, Melbourne on previous occasions. So I currently live in Monty, just up the road, with my wife and my two boys. Monty reminds me of where I grew up in uh, Winchester, near Winchester in Hampshire, in southern England, with its trees and rolling hills. So if you've seen escaped to the country, you probably know, already know all about it. And my adult years were spent in London following my studies in theology at King's College. So Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel and make disciples of all nations. As we know, the word nations in Greek is ethnos, which is where, which is where we get the expression ethnic groups or people groups. Now my question to you this morning is, can you guess how many ethnic groups or people groups there are in the world? That's my first question to you. Can you guess how many ethnic groups there are in the world? A lot is a very good answer, but can you be a little more specific? 5,000 is a very good uh, uh, response. Can you have something slightly more over here on the side? That's a little bit north of 5,000? 10,000 getting better, a little bit more, a few more thousand. That's too, that's too many. All right, yeah. So, a little bit more than uh, 10,000, 16,000. 16,000. But, but this is the important question. The important question is, how many of those 16,000 ethnicities have never been reached by the gospel? That's the important question. How many of those 16,000 people groups have ever been reached by the gospel? About 100. About 100? I'll take a percentage. 80%. 80 percent have never been reached by the gospel? Okay. Interesting. 5%. The answer is 40%. Oh, no. So that's about 6,500 people groups have never been reached by the gospel and never have heard about our Lord Jesus. So brothers and sisters in Christ, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And this is where the Bible leads comes into. I thought we could all read this together, assuming that there are people here who've never heard of the Bible. So we can all read this together. The purpose of the Bible League is serving the unresourced church globally through the provision of Bibles, biblical resources, and training to transform lives worldwide through God's Word and help people meet Jesus. Now, I'm not too sure if you're aware, but in the year 2019, there were 250 million Christians living in persecution globally. 
250 million Christians living in persecution in the year 2019. Now in the year 2021, that number had risen to 340 million. From 250 million in the year 2019 to 340 million in the year 2021. And getting the sources to them is fraught with danger and it's getting more and more dangerous every year. In fact, every quarter we have a new country that's added to our security guidelines. Just recently, Honduras and Mexico have just gone into our security guidelines. And one would have thought with the rich Catholic legacy of uh, the Mexicans that that would be the case. But uh, that's just how things are in the modern world. This means that for Christian missions working in the persecuted world, the work is extremely dangerous and sensitive. Now, I don't know if you knew, but if you're a Christian missionary and work in the field, your name automatically gets put on a database for radical Islamist groups. So when you arrive in a Muslim country, they know you've arrived. And you'll be tailgated wherever you go. And they will make sure that you do not do anything that they perceive as missional in their eyes. And you get one warning. So uh, our CEO, Hilton Edwards, was, uh, we did a lot of work in Bali and in Indonesia. And uh, our CEO was, uh, we worked with street children. We arranged to meet the street children on a certain beach in, uh, in Bali. And um, when you're tailgated by these um, Islamists, they make no bones about it because they always drive the same black car, they always wear the same garb, and in fact from place to place they even come and eat with you in the same restaurant. Um, but on this one occasion, as our CEO went out to meet the street children, the message went to his driver to get the white man off the beach. And uh, he literally just had to disappear into the, into the surroundings. So, uh, it is a very, very um, difficult operation. But I believe it also helps with other faith communities. We try to bring people out of Islam, Buddhism, and the spiritual slavery of Hinduism. We also reach out to the poor. However, you can only really give and give to the poor. Uh, this will only really reinforce the poverty cycle. Unless you change their thinking, they will always revert back to poverty. The Bible leads, Bible-based literacy courses, which I'll speak about in just a moment, have really helped to change this because it helps to transform their minds and their thinking. And it's here that we make a gentle argument for God's Word and the Holy Spirit. Resources are 
um, where we work here in the um, in lots of house churches in China and uh, from different house churches and churches all over the world. So we have three focused areas of engagement: Project Philip, Bible-based literacy, and church plant training. Bible lead strategy is all about discipleship. Generally, we don't give a Bible out unless people are being discipled. Because we want people to be physically engaged in reading the Bible. That way, it will remain in their hands and become a life study to them. This way, the Bible becomes a part of a person's life. So we just heard about the story of um, Philip in the book of Acts, which comes from our recent PEV um, sources, the plain English version, which goes out into First Nations, Christ, uh, First Nations people in Australia. And I think it's really this story that expro expresses the modus operandi of the Bible League most fully. And I think it's really worth um, reading the most pertinent, reading out the most pertinent bit just again. Then Philip ran up to the trailer and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I? He said. Unless somebody explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. So Project Philip is a 26 lesson booklet centred around the book of John. Young Christians come and grow in their faith and go out and bear fruit, and that fruit remains. There's no point giving a Bible unless people can read, so we are teaching both adults and children to read using biblical precepts and concepts. If we bring Christian education to people, it will help to change culture. And this is how Bible League operates. We are also involved with church planting. And since Bible League began in 1938 in Illinois, we have helped to plant 77,000 churches across the world. We are currently planting, well last year we planted 1,638 churches. That's 4.48 churches every day. For a church planter to graduate, they have to have at least 30 adults for one church. So in this instance, a church constitutes um, 30, 30 adults. And it's usually where two Project Philip groups come together. Now, some individuals will go on to plant more than one church, and the average planter in his lifetime plants 1.87 churches. And I found out an incredible statistic the other day. Out of the 8,000 churches in Nepal, the Bible League have helped to plant 2,400 of those churches. And we run an efficient model because it's the church partners that provide labour and we empower the locals. So Bible League works in a slightly different way to other Christian missions in as much as if you were to go to a new territory, let's say if you were to go to a new territory in Africa, in Zambia for example, we'd um, uh, partner with a group of churches there, we then parachute and master trainers who go in to train the locals on how to do project film. Uh, so um, much of the work done in Bible League's name is actually done by what, um, locals who are volunteers. And that's how it works. And that's how it works best. You may ask what we're doing in Australia. Well, 15% of what we raise in Australia goes back into Australian mission. And this is probably our most famous product. This is the um, prison Bible. And it's used by all the different uh, prison fellowships, but this is the actual resource which we provide free to um, prison um, inmates in Australia and New Zealand. It's a great resource as it has 52 life lessons in it.
For example, um, an inmate could find themselves in prison for the first time. It asks questions like, uh, I've just found myself in prison. How do I create a relationship with the other inmates? How do I build a relationship with the guards? How do I maintain my relationship with the Lord on leaving prison? And then it goes into Genesis and then finally ends with um, John's Apocalypse, the book of Revelations. So the idea is you get uh, all the answers in the beginning and all the questions in the beginning and then the answers in the end. And I've also heard one of the <coughs> best things about this particular publication is uh, you can't smoke the paper. <laughs> because it's prison and that's what happens. And in fact, on one of my first church missions, uh, when I started Bible League in uh, April um, last year, I went down to a house church in Cranbourne in southeast Melbourne. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. But there are only about five or six people there. It was quite intimidating actually doing a, 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 a talk in, 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 in such an intimate type of talk. And there was a gentleman there who was uh, dressed in shorts and singlet, and he had quite a large gentleman, he had tattoos everywhere, and he had those unmistakable tattoos across his, uh, across his knuckles. And at the end of my talk, he picked up this up and he said, this is why I'm here. 20 years ago, this is what happened. I was discipled by a chaplain through Project Philip Network. This is how I came to the Lord. But I would be thinking to myself, you know, it would be much easier for this guy to just stand up and deliver his testimony rather than me sweat over <laughs> doing my Bible League talk. It's just so much more powerful when you hear it from a horse's mouth, so to speak. Very powerful. This year we've helped to, um, we've supplied 8,000 uh, prison Bibles in, prison, in prisons in Australia. So yes, uh, you heard this morning from our plain English version, the PEV Bible. Uh, we've been working with retired Wycliffe translators on a simplified English version purely for Indigenous Australians. It takes a very long time because when we started working with these Wycliffe transla translators, they weren't yet retired. Uh, and there's no cost for this resource, so if you know anyone who is involved in Indigenous ministry, you can point them to the Bible League's Indigenous page. Um, currently, we have about 300 missionaries in the field, mainly in the Northern Territories and WA, Western Australia, who use our resources. And because we empower locals, it's mainly Indigenous Australians who use our resources. So if you know anyone who's involved in this um, world, then please come and have a conversation uh, with me afterwards. And we have two new um, books that have come out, um, uh, the plain English version. And what one of the books is, is an introduction to the Bible for Indigenous people. Because remember, their cosmologies and their ontologies are very, very different to our cosmologies and ontologies. So we've written a book about why and how the Bible came into being. It's like an introduction to the Bible, and this has proved to be a very, very valuable resource. You probably can't see those numbers. Yeah. Well, that's fine. Um, I can uh, just give you the important numbers. Um, Bible League grew 30% last year across all our ministries. And Bible League has grown through its ministry, not through fundraising. There's a very important difference here. 40% of Bible League's ministry across the world is focused on children and youth. A Bible League currently in 70 nations across the world, mainly in Africa and Asia, doing what we are called to do as part of the Great Commission, and that is to prepare people for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's difficult to see at a granular level what God is doing, and that is why I want <coughs> everybody today to take a copy of our prayer calendar, which I'll have out on the table afterwards. So everyone um, take a copy of our prayer calendar because it really gives you a very interesting snapshot of the depth and the breadth of Bible League's mission in the world in any one, of the, in any one day. Um, 
this is a very specific way of how you can help. Um, so 15% of our funds go into Australian missions. Um, broadly speaking, the main part of our work, I believe, goes into the 1040 window. Uh, so that's in the Islamic world. We do most of our work in the Islamic world. And actually, we produce a, bi um, a Bible that looks just like the Quran. It's a black leather bound um, Bible. And I don't know if you knew, but in the Islamic world, it's not proper for one Muslim to say to another, can I borrow your Quran and have a look at it? Uh, it's just not a socially acceptable thing to do. So you can quite happily walk down the main drag in Mecca with your Bible and no one will ask to see it. Quite clever, I thought. But obviously, because it's a black leather bound Bible, uh, there's, uh, that's the highest cost per unit. So a lot of our investment goes into the Islamic world in countries like Iran, Saudi Arabia, all these very difficult uh, places to, to work in. This is another ministry we're involved with in Ukraine. If you've been watching the heartbreaking scenes from there on the news and searching for a way to help, you're certainly not alone. Currently more than 7 million refugees have been displaced and another 7 million people within the Ukraine itself. Now it breaks my heart as a, a European to see this continent destroy itself once again and that's just 80 years from the last time it tried to destroy itself. And most striking of all is that it is ordinary people's lives that we are seeing destroyed and uh, systematically dismantled. And this is even before we begin to talk about the irreplaceable destruction of their art, culture, and identity. <laughs> so Bible League local partners on the ground meeting urgent needs for refugees, fleeing unspeakable violence, and pouring across borders into neighboring countries. But many refugees, it may surprise you, are asking for one thing above all others, God's word. <coughs> One of our Bible League source partners describes the scene. The pain of the local people is enormous, but they do not show fear or despair, but anxiety about the unknown. And they are responding to the words of hope and strength found in the living word of God as a lifeline. God's word is a lifeline, it's so true. You saw the video. But they tell us they have no Bibles. So I want to invite you into an opportunity to act today to help bring rural relief and hope to people who have lost everything. So Bible League is currently printing full Bibles and New Testaments in Ukrainian and Russian to distribute to refugees through our partners on the ground. We're also involved with distributing food, providing shelter and trauma counselling, but it's only really the project for up in the Bibles that uh, Bible League tends to speak about. Please pray for us. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities. <coughs> We need you to partner with us in what God is doing in the field by becoming a source partner. <coughs> you can help to send one million Bibles that are heading to Ukrainian refugees, and here's how. Local partners have asked for 4,000 Bibles to be shipped immediately, 50,000 in the next four weeks. Currently, Bible League is doing around about 40 to 50,000 Bibles a month. And this is taking place for up to 24 months. So by the end of this year, we would aim for one million Bibles. So your gift today of $45 can provide five full Bibles. $75 can provide 25 New Testaments. Now each Bible, statistically, is read by an average of five people. So if you go away and uh, do the maths, it can impact an entire community. So $45, for example, can provide five full Bibles, which can help 25 refugees. $75 can provide 25 New Testaments, which will have an impact on around about 125 people, 125 refugees. And remember, a family of five can help to transform a community. So there's a huge hunger 
uh, and a huge opportunity here, brothers and sisters in Christ, for the hunger for God's word is enormous. And God meets us in the times of our greatest need. Imagine that, they've lost everything, but they're asking for God's word. So if Bible League has touched your heart, and you'd like to see me after the show and see how you get involved more, please come and see me afterwards. So thank you very much for uh, your time for the first part of my uh, talk this morning about you know, Bible League, introducing you to Bible League this morning. I'd just like to read a passage from Luke 12. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old. With a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So when I first joined Bible League, my uh, CEO told me somewhat surprisingly, Chris, God does not need your money. It is you who needs to give to God. So let's go back to the Great Commission, Matthew 28. I think it's probably worth reading out of the full. Now the eleven disciples went down to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always till the end of the age. Jesus has been crucified, he has risen from the dead. He has made a pattern of appearing to his disciples unexpectedly. He has not yet ascended into heaven. In this passage, go and make disciples of all nations, Jesus is talking about spiritual reproduction. The writer of Genesis 2 gives an account of when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. This is physical reproduction. It's the same edict, but a different emphasis. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, not just the Jews. Jesus would go to all the unlikely ones. Go to your enemies and make disciples. It doesn't just say go and convert people. Now every Christian knows we are meant to share the gospel and look for opportunities to witness to Christ. Yet almost all of us find it a genuine struggle, if not a gloomy discouragement. The Great Commission doesn't feel so great after all. Complicating matters is that most of us do have a sincere desire that the people we love We've come to know the Lord as we do. Now, who here knows somebody whom we would like to know the Lord as we do? I certainly do. Unfortunately, any passion and boldness we may have in prayer apparently evaporates under the spotlights at the dinner table or in coffee break. 
In the secular world, attempting to bring someone else over to faith in Christ may once have been viewed as impolite or crass. Now, it may be regarded as something far more sinister. In fact, we could say that, and I quote from Michael Reed's book, God Shines Forth, mission and evangelism is the inevitable catch tacked onto the list of benefits we signed up for. It's the complicated and rather unwelcome add-on to salvation that God has included in the deal as the sweetener for himself. We buckle in, brace ourselves, and make the occasional attempt at sharing the gospel when we can bear it. Like stepping into a cold shower, we grit our teeth and get it over with. Okay, so here's a question for you. Who likes Scrabble? Yeah. Very good. So lots of hands go up. This is a slightly different question. Who is good at Scrabble? <laughs> Paul <laughs> is good at Scrabble. <clears throat> my wife is incredible at Scrabble. When I play my wife, it's like the left hand plays the right hand. I'm pretty useless, but um, I've grown in appreciation of two letter words. And Jesus has a favourite two letter word. Can you guess what that word is? Go! Go from this place and take something of Jesus with you. You can go across the road to visit your neighbour. You start wherever you are. You have people around to dinner. You get to know people at work. People go to the school gate, or in my case, daycare centre. What kind of book would work for that person? Mere Christianity? C.S. Lewis? Or maybe they need to look at Is Jesus, is his, is Jesus History by our own John Dixon. Or perhaps if they have an appreciation from the historical perspective, they could look at Tom Holland's Dominion, that big fat 600 pager, to understand the incredible debt that we owe to Jesus, his disciples, and the early church as it has played out through history. I have a friend in, uh, called Mike, who lives in London, actually, as a relatively new Christian, and I have a lot to thank him for. Uh, he's an itinerant preacher. Uh, he'll be found in coffee shops around Richmond, Richmond on Thames in southwest London, always reading a book, a Christian book, or a Christian theology book. He tells me, Chris, it helps if you have God or Christ in the title. Because I tell you, within 15 or 20 minutes, someone will be sat there next to me asking me questions. So I've got a lot of people currently on their way to work into the CBD, reading theology books with Christ or God in the title, to be bold in their faith. To gently challenge people. And never underestimate the power of a good question. Well, I sense the problem at the root of all our struggles with mission is almost certainly right at the beginning with our view of God. Mission is no clunky add-on to your own delighting in God. Instead, it is the natural overflow and expression of the enjoyment you have of Him, so that like Him, you gladly go out to fill the world with the word of his goodness. And Jesus went to the ones who were outcasts. And he went to them because they were bypassed by society. And in that challenge, we get to know Christ. And you never know Christ better than when you serve him. But just maybe your circumstances in life do not quite allow you to go yourself. Maybe you're not quite as mobile as you were. Maybe you have children. 
and you are unable to go directly. So go with Bible League to help make disciples of nations. The key thing here is to get behind people who can and who are actively doing that in the world, who are actively working in God's kingdom. What we can do is to get behind them. And even better to get behind an organisation that God has got his hands on. And this is the crooks. God's glory, his own naturally overspilling life, showcased in his son, his mission's rationale and motor. Mission is about our going out into the world to make God known. It is only ever our being caught up in the already gushing tide of blessing that flows from the heart of the Father in the Son. As Charles Spurgeon said, when I think of God, I am led to see his glory in the outgoing of his great heart, for he is altogether unselfish and unsparingly communicative. So here's my challenge to you. Who do you know out there? Think of one person you would like to invite here next week. It could be somebody who's not been to church for some time, perhaps never. It could be somebody who's experienced a life-challenging event. We'll bring them here to meet Jesus. Get involved in their lives. Pray. Allow the Holy Spirit to work in their lives. Because, brothers and sisters in Christ, it's time to be ready. The harvest is ready and the fruit is plentiful. And finally, before we end in prayer, I would like to leave you with how Paul sees mission and how he thinks about it in uh, Philippians. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. I may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may take the resurrection from the dead. Let us pray. Father, Abba, Heavenly Father, I thank your Son, Jesus Christ, that I can call you Father, that you reached your hand out through your Son Jesus Christ and through the power of the Holy Spirit to this prodigal Son that stands before you today. I thank you for this immense privilege to serve in your kingdom through the work of Bible League. Father God, I thank you and I commit all of the hearts of the people in this room to be opened through your word. <coughs> This short, short message for today and through the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, I can never thank you enough for the privilege to pray in the name of Jesus. Today we pray in your name. Amen. Amen.
creation. We bless you, we praise you. Through your goodness we have these gifts to share. Let's say this together. Accept and use our offerings for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. Blessed be God forever. Please be seated as Jeff leads us in our prayers. He told them to pray to the owner of the harvest and to send out workers to gather in that harvest. So everlasting God, we ask you to look down with love upon our parish here, Tina, as day by day we bring ourselves to be a body worthy of Jesus' name and be among the workers to gather in that harvest. We pray especially for Christian churches and missions elsewhere on this globe who face daily persecution. Strengthen, comfort, and encourage all those who suffer harassment, violence, imprisonment, and even death for being followers of Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Creator God, we live in a world becoming more secular and less religious. May we as Christians stand up for Jesus against world opinion and the sure knowledge that he stands up for us before you, our Father in heaven. We pray especially for your blessing on our Anglican Church, its leaders, members and particularly all for Charles who's head of the Anglican Church for the Archbishop of Canterbury, our Geoffrey O'Brien, our Archbishop Philip, Geneva our Bishop and particularly for Ben, Ivy, Paul, Penny, Terence, Connie and Katie and their families within Tima. We pray for our parish council. We pray for and missions Andy Miff and their family moving from Port Moresby to Mount Hagen. Think about CMS in Asia. Paul and Nicola Mangohi, Chris and Julie Dean and Timar Lester, PCA, CPM and St. Mark Fitzroy in their outreaches. And of course for our the collection of food that we assist them with and for Mark and Larry in their mission to Belarus and the Baltic States. We pray particularly today for Chris and ask for inspiration in the guidance of the Holy Spirit in his work with the Bible League. We pray for those organising and taking on Activities of the parish for growth in our congregation, for growth in our group, for our alpha courses, and of course for those developing new ministries within this parish. Bless all those whose preaching, teaching, and 
example inspires us with the message of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious Lord, we pray for the sick and suffering, for those undergoing treatments and surgery, for those convalescing, for those who recover, and that through our intercessions, they all may experience full recovery. We think today, team, Bev, Jenny, that's Jenny D and Jenny H, Liz, June, Carolyn and Carol. And of course, among those we love, Amanda, Jan, Kim, Lincoln, Rose, Graham, and Julie. Let's just stop for a moment and pray for someone who may be on your mind.